please spare all your Madonna or Britney Spears, depending on your generation. Jokes. Check. You have to go up, I think, with the upper level. I'm as uncomfortable as you are looking at it. <laughs> get it out, get it out. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> I have to get it out too because uh, uh, at this point, as I look down to my scripture, all I see is this giant zit situated on my cheek. <clears throat> as we've been studying this idea of sanctification, I am just trying to share with you things that I'm learning, things that um, the Scripture teaches, but that other individuals who are a lot smarter than I am have sort of been able to compile and put together in a right way where we can try and make sense out of the terms. Luke says about the people of God that they will serve God without fear in holiness and righteousness. Remember that we said that the idea of holiness was the idea of the inner thing going on. That there is an internal development and transformation of the character. And the inside then forces what follows, which is the outside. Okay, that's always going to be the case. If you're trying to fix the outside without fixing or addressing the inside, then you're never going to find peace. You're never going to find where God really wants you to be because when he established a pattern or a path, when he says this is the way that a, that a person will find X, then that's just the way it is. And in this passage, it is clear that, that a person is going to serve God, listen to it in holiness and righteousness. Holiness you can think of as being uh, rightness in character and righteousness being right doing or right conduct. To do the right. To do the right to the degree that you find God calling us within the Scripture is only possible for him who is right in his deepest place. See, if I'm right in character, if I am what God instructs, then I will find this path to be wiser, to be more sensible, even to be capable. But if I am only trying to externally apply or externally practice the kind of right doing that God requires, 
And I am not addressing what is going on on the inside. Then I am going to feel constantly uphill. I'm going to feel the weight of the, the standard. I'm going to feel like I am not measuring up in some way because it is going about it from the, from the wrong disposition. It's approaching an issue backward rather than forward. God has, through Christ, we're in the best generation of all times. God has, through Christ, removed the enemies that stood against us, preventing those under the previous covenant from serving God in holiness and righteousness. Now, because of the redemptive work of Christ, we are able to do that. That's pretty impressive. No wonder those individuals living under the previous covenant were like, man, live, where is that thing that God is talking about? Because that's going to be amazing. That's going to be incredible. So we are in a spot where things are totally comprehensively different. All right, so God has called you. Not only has He called you, but He's also made you holy and righteous. So if we're going to measure, I mean, if we're trying to examine ourselves, hey, how are we doing on that, okay? Uh, if God has called you to live in holiness and righteousness, What's the deal? How you get this worked out? What is for you and for me the standard relative to the idea of holiness? All right, well, let's look at several passages that are all going to say the same thing only from different angles. And then we'll have a very visible Answer. Let's start in 1 John chapter 3. 1 John 3. I'll wait for you at each spot because I want your eyes to see what is our standard. 1 John 3. 1. How great this incredible love from God. Oh man, that's awesome. And uh, we're called children. That's even better. The reason the world doesn't know us is because it doesn't know Him. Friends, uh, we are children of God, and what we are has not yet been made known. I was talking about our next bodies and things of that nature. But we know that when He appears, we will be like Him, for we'll see Him as He is. Here it is. Everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. All right. Uh, go over to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 19. We already know uh, the middle there of verse 16 that God is love. But in 19, John says we love because. He loved us. Okay, so now let's turn back to Matthew 5. Matthew 5. Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5. And notice what Jesus says here. Matthew 5. <clears throat> Verse 48, this is what our Master says. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, you see a pattern here? You need to purify yourself just like God is pure. 
Well, what about when it comes to love? What is the standard for love? Well, you love the way that God loved. The whole reason we are able to love is because we are looking at the standard that God is love. That's why we, in turn, then follow. God is our standard. We practice that behavior. Now, again, in Matthew 5, Jesus says, hey, God is your standard. That's what you're going after. You're striving for perfection like God is. Okay? So, now, let me read to you. Uh, no, you go with me. 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians 7. 2 Corinthians 7. I love the, uh, the end there of 16... Uh, for we are the temple of the living God. God said, I will live with them, walk with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. Okay? Now, based on that idea, there is this conclusion. Based on that connection, come out, be separate, don't touch things that are unclean. I will be a father to you. You will be sons and daughters. Man, that's pretty precious. And so uh, Paul says, just right in conjunction, since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence of God. First Peter 1, last one. First Peter 1. Then we'll try and make some conjunctive comments. First Peter 1. We'll tie it up. First Peter 1. We have looked at this. Verse 14. Uh, hey, you're obedient children now, right? And so, as a result, you're not to conform to the evil desires that you had when you lived in ignorance. That's not the path that God calls you. Or well, what path does God want you on? What is the comparable? But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. Holy. See, God is the comparable. In every scenario, I don't care whether you're dealing with your anger, whether you're dealing with jealousy, whether you're dealing with greed, whether you're dealing with, uh, you know, doubt or whatever, the, the, the standard is always going to be God. See, this is why Paul says in the book of 2 Corinthians, if we compare ourselves among each other and by each other, that's not wise. Because you know what that does. You know that you are very capable of finding someone who in your mind is less than you. And so you always want to refer. It's like a default. And you know how your phone has certain things and it's, set up and it goes back to the default this is our default mechanism our default is not to say i just did something wrong our default is it's not it's not as bad as this <laughs> see and that tastes a whole lot different than i just sinned against god i just violated god's will I just acted unholy. I just acted out of character for he who belongs to God. But our default mechanism, that thing that is built in inside of you, is always on the ready to compare yourself to someone else because that is easy. 
I'm not as bad as so-and-so, and it makes you feel a little bit taller, a little bit better. And Paul says, you go that path, forget it. That will not lead you to the place where God designed and desires you to be. Holiness is the comparable to God Himself. He and He alone is your comparable. I am not your comparable. You are not my comparable. Not this week or not next week. God is your only comparable. That's it. Be holy as the preacher. No. Be just holier than the person who sits in front of you. No. You be holy like God is holy. Well, what's that like? What does that look like? How can you be holy like that? Holiness and righteousness in a person's experience. are a direct result of fellowship with your God. I want you to understand that that is the key. If there is going to be holiness and subsequent righteousness, growing Growing in practice and manifestation in various areas, it will be a direct result of your fellowship with God. But the devil was a liar. And incidentally, also a murderer. Jesus said about those two things, about the devil, that, that he has always been those two things. A liar and a murderer. He stands opposite to everything that is God's holiness. Lies and murder are opposite to God's entire character all right so how do you how do you sum that up i mean where do you go what do you say uh just as an example it's not the only thing but i think it's very comprehensive uh, is the idea that jesus christ is the exact representation of god that's what the book of hebrews says about your lord and it just so happens that the Apostle John in chapter 1 says that, that when Jesus came, he was, listen to it, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. For me, holiness in my life means close approximation to God's grace and truth so that in my own life I am demonstrating what I see 
from my God. The closer I am to God and understanding that God is the the picture-perfect representation of grace and truth, when I put myself up in that space and I look God face to face, When I take this word and I see grace and truth of God on the page, it leads my heart to say, Lord, help me to be what I'm reading. Let that attitude run over me in my life. Because it has nothing to do with whether or not I'm better than my wife or better than my kids or better than you. See, what do you care? We should, intrinsically, we should care about one another. I'm not saying that I don't care about you or, or your holiness. But my approximation to God is not based upon the fact that I am stepping on you in order to get it. Do you understand? I have to look this standard. It's three feet or whatever it is. I have to look that standard in the face. This is true about my life. And just because I step up and step on you while I'm doing it, to make myself feel better doesn't mean I'm meeting God's standard. Oh, yeah, it makes me feel better. Of course it does. That's why I play that ridiculous game. But all along, God is saying, no, preacher, it's not about you stepping on somebody else so that you can look over the fence. It's just about you. In your life, Alex Bays, when you look at grace and truth, are you looking for those qualities to consume your life? Are you wanting to be so close to God that His character, his being, his nature becomes your teacher. Holiness in me is right relationship to God. He wants me in this space. He wants me to be close. He wants me to be listening. He wants me to be submissive. He wants me to be willing to learn. He wants me to turn from sin. All the things that I know about God, if I am in a right relationship with God, that relationship will produce More of the characters of God, qualities of God in my life. In my life. Every single solitary action that God does is demonstrated. Capsulate mm -mm. it is caught up in this idea of grace and truth. Everything that God does stems from that. 
That's God's holiness. Holiness in me is, is my approximation to that love and truth. How am I a man in character? Closely related to grace and truth. See, when Jesus came and he was full of grace and truth, he said, remember to Philip, he said, Philip, mm, I've been with you three years. The sole thing that I wanted you to be able to see at the end of this three years is that when you looked at me, you would see God. So when you take those qualities, that idea of grace and truth, and you, and you put that in front of you, it is giving you this broad, painted, beautifully descriptive image of who your maker is. Man, is everything that I do motivated by grace and truth? See, it's not about whether or not I am more than you. Whether or not I do something X more than you, whether or not I pray more than you or read my Bible more than you or have more time for this more than you. It's just about me. And tonight the reality is, is that it's just about you. This is your practice. This is your life. And that's why I'm trying to explain this process of sanctification. Sanctification is the process. It is the thing that God wants going on in your life that takes you from infancy in Christ to maturity. But through that process, you get wiser, smarter, more obedient, submissive, more faithful, more ready. Whereas in your youth, somebody corrected you, you sort of resisted it and been like, man, that guy, he's no better than me. Now you're a little wiser, you're a little smarter, and somebody says something, hey, you're being stupid. You, you say, hey, okay, you're right, I am, I'll do better. Because you're growing. Because it's the process whereby God is ruling in your life. It's the sanctification process. And God will make what belongs to Him. Holy. In living. Holiness is a life that is love master and true in everything it does. Man. What's remaining in your life? Okay? I, I, I need to talk about this. So stay with me just a second. What's remaining? What's remaining in your life that is, that is against grace and truth? I don't care if you're better than your wife. I don't care. God does not care. What is remaining in your life tonight, you? This is between you and your God. What is remaining? What's missing? It's not under the influence of grace and truth. Man. See, that's where God is wanting to scoot us to. I suggest to you tonight this. I suggest that if you want to move closer to God, if you want 
more holiness in your heart. I suggest to you that God will give you that very thing. It is His expressed desire. We've already seen it in the redemptive course of man. Jesus Christ came to save so that this fear of not being able to serve would be removed. And that the the replacement would be an attitude of holiness and righteousness in our quality, in our character, in our conduct. And then all throughout the Scripture, God says, look at me. Look at me. You you want to evaluate the standard of honesty? Look at me. You want to evaluate the standard of faithfulness? Look at me. You want to evaluate the things that are true, the things that are lovely and noble and praiseworthy? Look at me. Do you want to identify things that are pure? Look at me. If you want to understand what it means in your life to be holy, like I want you to be, look at me. You can. That's why I tried to tell you this morning about the chair. God has equipped you. You have every advantage that people of previous generations didn't get. They didn't have the work of the Spirit. They didn't have 18,000 pages worth of examples. They didn't have the promises that are revealed in Christ Jesus. Even these things that are being made, made sense of here by the Apostle Paul in like the letter to the Corinthians. And we get that. We get all of that. And so we're situated for success. You are situated for success. God desires fellowship with you. He does. And He will make you more like Him if that's what you want to permit Him to do. Oh, that's beautiful. Go get it. God will give you all you want. Let's pray. God, help us to see you. Help us to see you as holy. Stop chasing things that don't matter. Let us look into the things that are eternal. Let us evaluate your grace and truth. Fill us up, God. Fill us up with your Spirit. The strength of the Spirit. The Word of the Spirit. The power of the Spirit. So that we can be holy in what we do. Because you're helping us to become holy in who we are. We praise you. In Christ's name, amen. If you need to respond to the invitation, and now is the time to do that. We'll pray with you and for you. Help you any way we can tonight. If you're ready to become a New Testament Christian and, and ready to follow Jesus Christ, we're encouraging you. We can pray for you. We'll do that. As together we stand and sing this song.